and we're going to talk today, just do a prophecy update, on some church theological and cultural issues. I don't have time to get into anything on the Mideast, and we'll probably try to catch up on that next week. So this week, and again, I had a number of meetings when we were in California. I talked to a number of people that are in the professional, I guess, prophecy ministry. We had a sort of a mini summit up at uh, church in Simi Valley um, a week ago Wednesday. We sat and talked for over 10 hours, almost straight without any break. Um, it was a fascinating day on the way up. My wife will confirm this. She's always yelling at me, did you check the gas? Did you check? Yeah, we got plenty of gas. And I'd gone out to go play golf the day before with Bill Salas and Eric Barger in Palm Springs. And we're driving down the 118 freeway. We're about a oh, quarter mile to half mile from the exit. And all of a sudden, when Pam and I are talking, and all of a sudden the RPMs on the car <laughs> dropped. So she gets a little bit upset, not mad, but just <laughs> concerned about, we're on the freeway and we don't have any gas. I said, don't worry, because uh, we ran enough, I was able to coast down a downhill exit ramp and then it's downhill there <laughs> to a gas station. So we had a few nice people stop and help us out and everything. So it always works out. I don't know what she's so <laughs> worried about. And um, I could tell you stories. Uh, So we're going to do, but the one thing that we talked about at the, our little summit was this convergence of events that we keep talking about. All of these things that are significant end times prophecy events seem to be in the stages of developing, happening, uh, and unfolding right before our eyes all at the same time. All of the pr people that were there to a person, and these are people who are doing, I think, very significant things in the world of Bible prophecy and teaching. They all said, we, it's almost impossible. We've got to figure out some way because we can't keep up. There's too much going on, and all of us are killing ourselves, so we've been talking about some things that we might be able to put together. One of the things I want to talk about first is just a little update on the economy. Now this is a map, this is England, of course, Netherlands, France, Belgium, London, you can see there on the left side. And that red circle is a town called Shearson. And it looks something like this. That's uh, the, I can't remember the name of the river there. It's a port area. And there is a, right here, and this is kind of an economic indicator. This is one of dozens of places like this around the world. You probably don't even know about them. And what's there is this, cars, unsold cars. The big automakers make too many cars. They don't sell them, they need to store them. Here's another picture of uh, the place in Shearson. This is all unsold cars. And there's dozens and dozens of these things all over the world where car manufacturers are not selling cars because at this point, most people that can afford a car have one or two, or my neighbors, at least five um, with two people. Well, they, their son and uh, his girlfriend are there right now. So there's at least five cars next door and four people. I know the dog doesn't drive, so it's just, so everybody that has a car pretty much has one, and people want the latest, so they'll buy new ones, but there's a lot of unsold cars, and so when the car companies tell you about all the great car sales, it's a, it's a false number. Here's a Nissan proving ground in England that they can't use as a proving ground because it's full of parked cars. This is in St. Petersburg, Russia. And there are a number of sites like this all over China. This is an airport that they can't use as an airport now because you don't want to land on top of cars. It's a big problem. This is something also that you should know about. Student debt. Student debt is growing really exponentially. This is a line that shows student debt 
held by people when they graduated. And you'll see until about 1993, people pretty much were able to graduate from school without much debt. I mean, I remember, I was talking to a young person, we used to plan, uh, you could pretty much work in the summer and earn, if you had a decent paying job in a factory or something, you could earn just about enough to pay for the next year's school tuition and room and board. That's not the case anymore. And so this student debt is now, this is from 2013, it's now $1.2 trillion. And over 10% of it is student debt that is more than 90 days delinquent. That means that's debt they never expect to collect. People will not pay that back. And there's a significant number, well over 30%, that's more than 30 days past due. So these are, this is an economic factor that a lot of people aren't looking at. This kind of shows the, uh, the blue line, the increase in student debt, and then the red line here is the increase in defaulted debt. And you can see that it's grown quite a, bu a bit. Well, we were in California. California is in the midst of a major drought. Um, there was a fire about eight miles away from us the couple days after uh, we got there. Uh, 60, 40, 50, 60 mile an hour winds gusting to 90. Everything's dry like a tender box. And uh, the other day there were nine major fires raging in the Los Angeles area. The season usually doesn't start until July. Uh, this is, uh, it's extremely dry out there. They've had only about three inches of rain since last July. Uh, it was great for golf, but not so great for this. Of course, a lot of people are tying this to global warming. I don't know exactly what the cause is. I know that it does seem that the weather, uh, I'm playing golf yesterday and I had to quit because it was hailing and the green got covered with ice. Um, a major tragedy. I, I'm sure you share my pain. But I want to just this, um, this will kind of be a theme that I'm going to talk about a little bit this morning. There is this politically correct and acceptable speech problem that we have right now. Some people would call it political correctness. I personally call it fascism, where they're trying to control people's thoughts and what they say. This is a headline from the, the Times of London yesterday about scientists are charging that there's a cover-up of damaging climate science information. Now, we know that things came out about a year or so ago. They had leaked a bunch of emails about how they were fudging the data and that type of thing. Mark Stein wrote columns about it. He's been sued by Michael Mann. Uh, the lead, the guy that made the hockey stick graph that Al Gore got an Academy Award for. And these guys are fascists. They're going around trying to keep people from speaking what they're finding about uh, clients, climate science. What these guys found was that you really can't tie any increase in temperature to increase in carbon emissions, which is what everybody wants to do it because then they can control how you live. But these guys, they're being, they're being kicked off boards, they're being kicked out of schools, they're uh, losing their positions, their papers are not getting published because there's this desire to control what people think in this area. And we're seeing this all over. If you want to see a little bit of summary of this, Mike, uh, Mark Stein's column from May 16th talking about that. He's being sued by uh, Michael Mann and he needs money uh, because you know he's he's being sued for defamation and libel and that sort of thing now another interesting related thing is that uh, there's a big fight going on in cosmology now because some people have looked and they observed certain things that they say only could have come from the Big Bang now a lot of scientists both cosmo cos cosmetologists, yeah. cosmologists, <laughs> cosmologists, and others 
want to control that view because they don't want there to be a big bang or a beginning because that undermines their whole worldview that there whether there's a god and so there's a big fight now in the world of cosmology over this are these people going to be allowed to publish their findings people are saying well this isn't helpful this is undermining science and that type of thing and you think that science is about a pursuit of the truth that's not true you can point to all sorts of things in science uh, for example when somebody came up and said there was a finite speed or a measurable speed of light it was decades before that was accepted in science because people said no light was uh, had an infinite speed well it looked infinite to us it just goes really fast so this is, but this again, this is part of this thing that I believe you're going to see as we move closer to a one world leader, a one world government will be these attempts to control people, speech and activities. Now, we know uh, from reading in Genesis chapter 11 that at the time of the Tower of Babel, they wanted to make themselves as God. In verse 4 of Genesis chapter 11, it says, they said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven, and let us make for ourselves a name, otherwise we will be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. And in verse 5, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language, and this is what they began to do, and now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. And so God judged them. But what happened at the time of the Tower of Babel, the first real outright rebellion after the flood, the first, or not the, near the first, the actual first rebellion against God, after the flood, God judged. But remember, there is a pattern to prophecy. And so what happened at the time of the first judgment will be what is happening at the time of the final judgment. And men will be shaking their fists in God's face, saying, you, you can't tell us what to do. We know better. We are like gods. You see this happening in theology. You see it in the word faith movement. You see it in science. You see it in transhumanism. And the Bible is very explicit. It says this, see to it, in Colossians 2, verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world. We're supposed to, as Christians, be aware of that and avoid it because it's empty philosophy that will take us away from the true God and his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We also know that at the end that there will be a great apostasy. 2 Thessalonians 2. It will not come unless the apostasy comes first. The falling away, that'll happen in the church. And I've talked about this for many years here, that the deception and the end operates on many levels. It'll be economic, it'll be social, it'll be cultural, it'll be religious. There will be people that are deceived. And the true believer, I think, will look around and wonder, what where have people lost their minds what is can't they see and the answer is no they can't because they are under the judgment of god and their only hope is salvation in jesus christ otherwise everybody is going to be deceived and the deception will operate on a massive scale it will be so great jesus said that even the very elect could be deceived that's how clever, that's how cunning, that's how problematic it's going to be. And so we as believers need to be aware of that. And that's why we talk a lot about this. Now, one of the things that Pam and I did in California, and we don't very often do this, um, is go to a movie. Now, the last one we saw was the Avengers, mainly because our car dealer got us free tickets to a premiere of it. And so we decided, well, 
we kind of know the characters. And so we went to see Captain America, the Winter Soldier. And there's Captain America in the middle, the Black Widow, and Nick Fury there on your left. Um, and I wanted to see it. I was kind of curious because I was up in Cleveland a couple times last summer, a year ago, and I was trying to get out of the courthouse. And first of all, I had to park about six blocks away, and I had a sprained ankle at the time, so I'm hobbling over in the rain. I get to the court, I'm soaking wet, and I went to come out to go back to my car, and I couldn't leave right away because they had the streets all blocked off around the courthouse, Lakeside Avenue, and the shoreway because they were filming this movie. Every trailer in that, before that movie started, was about the occult and transhumanism. Every single trailer. Occult and transhumanism. The movie itself was about the occult and transhumanism. I had a long conversation with Patrick Wood about that very topic. And I told him about the movie. He sent me an email late last night and said he went and he said, oh my goodness, it's worth, you know, it's even worse than I, I know it's coming, you know, and I've taught about it for years, but it's probably worse. And in one of our meetings, one person made the comment that the devil knows what's coming. He's a student of Bible prophecy. We know that from reading scripture. And he has a media group that's actively working on his behalf, and they live locally out there in California. This transhumanism thing is something that you need to be aware of that's coming. Now, part of me likes some of the developments in that area since I have a number of artificial joints, and they help me function. But there's a much more sinister philosophy behind this, and uh, Wesley Smith, writing, he writes for National Review, uh, and at this Evolution and Views website, which is an intelligent design website. Uh, there's a lot of good articles there. He's wrote a book called The War on Humans. And he was at a transhumanism seminar that happened the other day, and he had this to say. For now, I have to say that my previous opinion of transhumanism is a materialistic religion, or perhaps better stated, a worldview that seeks to obtain the benefits of religion without submitting to concepts of sin or the humility of believing in a higher being is being substantially borne out. Transhumanism seeks to transform human evolution from a purposeless phenomenon to one steeped in meaning. He goes on to say this, transhumanism is a thrust towards transcendence. That's actually the name of a new movie that's out that has that transhumanism theme. It is not classical mysticism, that's an important word, mysticism, but seeks a temporal transcendence. Tra classical mysticism, and the way he's using it is, we think we'll do this activity and we'll become like God, or we'll become one with God, one with the all-consuming force of the universe. The driving force behind this is evolution. What is reality? Reality is evolution. It has, it, is, it has a direction from the simple to the complex. Now he's only saying what they say about evolution. The most complex outcome is intelligence. Thus evolution is aimed at intelligence. We should thus have a will to evolve. This is what he's learning from this uh, seminar. We have a moral responsibility to increase evolution and do so by continually striving to expand our abilities throughout life by acting in harmony with the evolutionary process. Science and technology move us towards utopia. One of the most exciting things about transhumanism is that all will be fixed. This is what somebody said at this transhumanism conference. This is the Tower of Babel all over again. It's just in a different form this time. But God judged it before, God will judge it again. Smith concludes with some of these thoughts. I do worry about the value system and the zeal to achieve a materialist New Jerusalem that transhumanism can engender. I don't see any way that can lead to a positive outcome. We don't have the wisdom to intelligently redesign ourselves into an inherently different being as contrasted with, say, using technology as a tool 
to improve our present lives by, for example, the grafting of a prosthetic arm after amputation. We are, after all, the species that built the unsinkable ship Titanic. But listen, this transhumanism thing and mysticism that lies at the heart of it is something you need to be keenly aware of in the days, weeks, months, and maybe years ahead. You're going to see it everywhere. Now, my friend Jim Fletcher, who writes for World Net Daily and the Jerusalem blogs of the Jerusalem Post, went to Catalyst West in Dallas a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he put this on his Facebook page. He later wrote an article for World Net Daily, and some of the discernment blogs picked it up. And one of the things that he got while he was there, he paid the money, was on sale for $149. And he bought, now, I want to back up just one second. Catalyst, the person who had the vision for Catalyst was Andy Stanley out of North Point Church. Okay. Everybody wants to partner with Catalyst. That's why Grace Brethren Foreign Missions, one of the main reasons they moved to Atlanta was to be there near Catalyst. There's a big conference of Catalyst there. They have Catalyst West. Uh, and one of the things that you can get, uh, you have to pay $169 for it, is the Catalyst Known Experience, they call it Known, that was the study, the Experience Kit all the DVDs, the MP3s, and some other things that are thrown into your goodie bag there for $149. But I want you to look at some of these things. Now listen, Andy Stanley's the son of Charles Stanley. I know a lot of people in here listen to Charles Stanley. My friends, things have changed in the evangelical church. You need to be watching and questioning almost everything you see happening everywhere. I personally believe that if we're close to the return of the Lord in the days, weeks, months, and maybe years ahead, a lot of the things that we have considered to be firm foundations, denominations, fellowships, churches, and that type of thing, those foundations are gonna be ripped away in the flood that's coming of deception. And the only anchor you have is the word of God in Jesus Christ. That's it, and the Holy Spirit. That's where you need to anchor yourself, not on people. You need to be good Bereans. It is not, I, this is my fear, it is not going to be possible to tell you all of the deceptions that are coming in the future. I, there's not enough time. You're going to have to be looking on your own, okay? So in this experience of kit, um, this is just stunning, is a album from Jesus Culture. Jesus Culture comes out of the uh, Bill Johnson's church in Bethel, California. The thing that's also stunning is these occult symbols are all over Christian music, folks. There's videos out there. Joe Schimmel, the church pastor of the church where we were, uh, does a lot of really great videos at Good Fight Ministries. You ought to look them up, Good Fight Ministries. Joe Schimmel, the Submerging Church. You may have seen that video. Joe and his team put that together. They have some others out it, and uh, don't have time to go into today, but Pam was in on these conversations, and some of them were just absolutely mind-blowing. Even for you know people who, some of whom were involved in the professional discernment ministry, it was like, I can't believe what I've seen. So Jesus Culture, Bill Johnson, look at what some of the things he said was this. This is Bill Johnson. He wrote a book, When Heaven. Those who feel safe because of their intellectual grasp of scriptures enjoy a false sense of security. None of us has a full grasp of scripture, but we all have the Holy Spirit. He is our common denominator who will always lead us into truth, but to follow him, we must be willing to follow off the map to go beyond what we know. He asks questions like, did you know Jesus was born again? Most of all the experiences that Jesus recorded in scripture were prophetic examples of the realms and God that are made available to the believer. 
The Mount of Transfiguration raised the bar significantly on potential human experience. And this Bethel church is into all sorts of nonsense. Do you know that they have teams that go out and do what they call grave soaking? They lay on the graves of believers who've died to soak up their spirit. It's, this is necromancy. This is specifically condemned in scripture. Bill Johnson was one of the guys, this, remember Todd Bentley, we talked about him a lot here, that crazy goon down in Lakeland, Florida. Look, his commissioning service for Todd with John Arnott, that's the guy who started the Laughing Revival from the airport vineyard in Canada. Shay On, who's in Pasadena, California. Bill Johnson, who's up in Northern California at Reading. Here's Todd Bentley at the commissioning service where they laid hands on him. And, and within a week, Todd had left his wife and run off with one of his uh, ministry assistants. But this is what they put, Catalyst put this in the experience kit, the music from the people at this church. My question is, where is the discernment? Deception, I told you. You've got to be aware of all of this stuff going on. It's happening everywhere. And I would say this, if you're in, you know, and there are people who will be listening to this on YouTube. If you're in a church that's partnered with Catalyst and you're seeing this stuff and Andy Stanley's being quoted in the pulpit and that type of thing, uh, the Bible tells us to get out of Babylon, okay? So you need to get out of Babylon because you're in something that is on the wrong track. What, another thing that's in there is the Enneagram Institute RETI assessment. This is a, well, this, go to the, I went to the Enneagram Institute website. This is used, by the way, by a guy named Peter Cazero, who has a thing called Emotionally Healthy Church, Emotionally, emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And he bases a lot of his stuff on the Enneagram, which is like a psychological testing. And he, um, uh, the Enneagram, if you want to know where it's being used, uh, these are the local churches that use the Enneagram in their ministries. This is just the top, the ones within 15 miles of Dublin. So you've got the First Alliance Church Columbus, Bethel Presbyterian, Upper Arlington Lutheran, Riverside, Trinity United Methodist, Vineyard Columbus, Heritage Christian Church, Central College, Presbyterian, Life Vineyard, West Community Church. It's a huge list. Now I bring the Peter Schizero and Emotionally Healthy because you know I had some issues with Grace College and seminary and Christy Hill's teaching about spiritual formation. One of the books, this is her syllabus, see this? Peter Schizero, The Emotionally Healthy Church. And I objected to the Enneagram. Look at what the Enneagram website says. The Enneagram of personality types is a modern synthesis of a number of ancient wisdom traditions, but the person who originally put the system together was Oscar Ichazo. The Enneagram symbol has roots in antiquity and can be traced back at least as far as the works of Pythagoras. The symbol was reintroduced into the modern world. It uh, goes on. These ideas found their way from Greece and Asia Minor southward through Syria and eventually to Egypt. There it was embraced by early Christian mystics, embraced, known as the Desert Fathers, who focused on studying the loss of the divine forms in ego consciousness. Another key influence that Kazo employed in developing these ideas comes from mystical Judaism, mystical Judaism, and particularly the teachings of the Kabbalah. Central to the Kabbalah, is a diagram called the Tree of Life. And this is used in churches everywhere. There's a book out, it's called The Labyrinth of the Enneagram, how, Enneagram, how to use it to pray. This is the labyrinth in the courtyard of the Grace Brethren Church in Long Beach, California. Enneagram Ohio website, they operate out of First Community Church down in Marble Cliff, down in Grandview says this, I am grateful, uh, they have a prayer. There's an Enneagram prayer. Now I want you to listen to this. Now you, you listen to it, you be a good Berean, and you make a conclusion as to whether this is Christian or not, okay? This is what they gave to evangelical pastors and leaders at the, 
thing. You got a free Enneagram assessment. So, and here's a free download so you can incorporate it into your ministry. Yeah. Folks, people have lost their minds. I, it, this is the prayer. This is on the Enneagram website. Go look at Enneagram and spirituality. I'm grateful that I live in a perfect universe and know that my own perfection, because my true nature is the universal source itself. I am grateful that the universe is made of love and that I am filled with an endless supply of love that I both give and receive. I am grateful that I live in a dynamic universe and know that I can achieve everything that is my heart's desire. It sounds like Joel Osteen. I am grateful that I am an individual with my own life experience and unique gifts as well as being an expression of the universal whole. This is rank unadulterated mysticism that's incorporated all of these mystic practices, layered it with psychology, and it's used in all of our seminaries all over the place. Okay? Jesus said, look, when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. <clears throat> Now, what Jim Fletcher's article about was, this is a picture I think he took at the Catalyst thing. You see the people there with their hands spread out? They're being taught centering prayer by a lady named Vilina Hurritz. She has a website. This is her biography. She's part of a group called Red Letter Christians. Her website, Gravity, that she operates with her husband. She went to Asbury College down in Kentucky, uh, Lexington, Kentucky. Well, outside of Lexington, Kentucky. Contemplative spirituality, this is what she says, is crucial to authentic, creative, liberating social change. And there you have another leg of this problem, social justice. Okay, here's uh, a clip of her uh, speaking, I'm not sure where, but uh, Let's just uh, look at a couple of these clips. Contemplative spirituality is supported by prayer practices such as Lexio Divina, Centering Prayer, Breath Prayer, and the Prayer of Examine. Contemplative prayer is not a new idea. It's as ancient as the third and fourth century desert mothers and fathers and doctors of the church like St. John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila. Contemplative prayer is simple, but it's difficult for the false self and the ego because it cultivates this internal posture of, of surrender, of consenting to the action of God within us, allowing our unconscious motivations to be purified so that we live more often from our centered belovedness, making optimal redemptive impact in the world. That was actually done at the Q conference, but she speaks at all these conferences, folks. The Q conference, that was Gabe Lyons, uh, and um, that's what he set up. They meet in New York. Uh, he came and spoke at the Grace Brother National Conference in 2009 over at uh, the church over here. Listen to this. Or are you genuinely living from that place of your divine center, your true self, your belovedness? Are you? <laughs> Here's what else she said. Or are you genuinely living from that place of your divine center, your true self, your belovedness? For me, I grew up in the um, evangelical tradition. And in my adult life, I um, came into the Catholic Church. And I think a lot of this was spirit-led. You know, as I grow in Christ and become more of who God's created me to be, the Catholic tradition um, was becoming a sort of an incubator for my soul. And really, the contemplative um, part of me felt really nurtured in the Catholic faith. And so, I had to make that decision and I wanted to come into the Catholic Church and it was like, oh my gosh, like what is my husband going to think, what is my father going to think, what is my community going to think? And it really dumbfounded a lot of people, I mean they were just like, how can you do, even in 2011 where we've made so much, uh, so many strides toward bringing unity between Protestants and Catholics, man, people just could not understand it. I lost some supporters. Uh, and, uh, who just couldn't couldn't accept that and then just people are dumbfounded everywhere because they're like now wait a minute you know pro some of the protestants a lot of the Pro protestants i know they're like okay um 
Catholicism isn't isn't right, but I know Felina, and and I see her life, and I see her faith, and her relationship with God, and they're like, how do these two go together? You know, so it's been really, really interesting that way. Yeah, so God will lead us to do things that we might not have naturally done on our own, um, and they take courage uh, to to make those decisions and those steps, but. Uh, if we do it, we become more of who God's called us to be, I think. But you see how this is, this mysticism now, it's talked about in terms of unity, bringing people together. Similar to what I said just a few minutes ago. Good Christians, if you're listening to this and you're in a church that's bringing this stuff in, get out, leave, leave Babylon and go find a good fellowship. Or get a group of people that want to study the Bible and get back into the Word and leave this nonsense, this mysticism, satanically inspired mysticism aside. Was that clear? <laughs> now, I want to play for you a short part of her introduction at chapel one month ago, April 4th, 2014 at Taylor University. A reading from Lamentations 3, 25 through 28. The Most High is good to those who hope in God. To all who seek God's presence, it is good to wait patiently for Yahweh to set us free. Let those who bear such a burden sit in silence. I'm very excited to introduce our chapel speaker this morning. Author, spiritual director, yoga instructor, public speaker, and retreat guide, Felina Hewitz is passionate about spirituality and making the world a better place. Felina's first half of life was formed on the streets of more than 70 countries, building community among victims of human trafficking, survivors of HIV and AIDS, abandoned children, and child soldiers and war brides. Drawing on 40 years of collective experience fighting global poverty and injustice with Word Made Flesh, great organization by the way, in 2012, she and her husband Chris co-founded Gravity to support the development of Christian consciousness and an ongoing effort to respond to the challenging social justice perils of our time. Taylor University, I would suspect most of you would say that this is a great evangelical institution, okay? So listen to her for just a moment. Or are the Sunday school answers for life that you learned as a child falling short in the face of 21st century social and political realities and challenges? Do you find yourself ever questioning God or the teachings of the church, wondering how your faith really makes a difference in the world, let alone in your own life? Nearly 10 years ago, Upon returning from my first visit to Sierra Leone, my religious paradigms were severely challenged and I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know how to relate to God in the midst of these tormenting doubts and questions. And it wasn't long after that that I met an old Cistercian monk named Thomas Keating. And he introduced me to the rich tradition of the contemplative tradition in our Christian faith and a practice called centering prayer. He taught me how to pray without words or thoughts. He taught me the way of pure prayer, being with God in authentic, naked self-surrender, just as I am with all my personal brokenness and with the brokenness of the world that I carry in my heart. Father Thomas says that at the point of religious conversion, we ask, what can I do for God? Well, she goes on. She goes on then to actually lead the student body there at chapel that day in centering prayer, using the verse, be still and know that I am God. Are you ready to be fully alive? Then help yourself wake up by embracing practices of solitude, silence, and stillness. I'd like us to pray Psalm 4610 as we close, I'll repeat, I'll say the phrase and invite you to repeat it aloud back to me. 
It'll be five consecutively diminishing sentences will end with B. So I invite you to take a posture that allows you to be upright, both feet on the floor, fully attentive, alive, open, receptive to the presence of God that is within you and all around you. I invite you to place your hands on your lap, perhaps palms open in a receptive way. Gently close the eyes and repeat aloud after me. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be. I invite you to stay in that place of presence. This is theological nonsense. But this is what's going on in Christian colleges all over the country. Now, Jim Fletcher, you should go look on Blog Talk Radio for Rapture Ready Radio. Jim Fletcher and Chris Quintana, Calvary Chapel pastor in Cypress, California, did a show on this the other night, specifically about her and a book called Jesus Calling. I'm sure most of you have seen the book Jesus Calling. Uh, Chris Quintana made a very salient point. I didn't have time to get the audio clip, so I'll try to paraphrase. It's near the end of the hour-long program. You really should listen to it. And he said this, he said, I went to Biola and I sat down with the professors there in the Department of Spiritual Formation. You've heard that term, spiritual formation. Now, look, when I started raising objections about this at Grace College and Seminary, I was told, don't worry, we're just doing what they're doing at Biola and Dallas. So I went and found out what they're doing at Biola in Dallas, and that's when I got concerned. They published a spiritual formation journal out of Biola University. Chris said, I spoke down, and I was concerned that these people were so enamored with Henry Nowen. Henry Nowen was a homosexual Catholic. He was at Yale University. And near the end of his life, and they said, well, we learned so much from the wisdom of Henry Nowen. And you've probably heard pastors and churches quote Henry Nowen. But Chris made, Pastor Chris made a wonderful observation. He goes, guys, at the end of his life, Henry Nowen believed that Jesus was just one of many doors that people could open to get to God. He was a universalist. So guys, I don't care whether you can glean wisdom from him throughout his life. When he finished, he didn't finish well, and he was off track, and he was a heretic. Maybe all of this stuff he was into all the way along had something to do with him ending up that way. And I will tell you, left unchecked, the church, churches, people, individuals, organizations that are into this stuff, that's where they're going to end up. Rob Bell ended up there, and when Rob Bell denied hell in his book, Love Wins, that was not surprising to me because I've listened to his sermons over the years and I knew he was on that track. You need to be aware of this. If you have friends in churches that are practicing this stuff, I think you need to tell them in love you need to get out of that place. Find some place good to go to. Call them up. Most of this stuff in evangelical colleges and universities comes through spiritual formation programs in the seminary. I did a lot of research on it, and a lot of you have seen my paper on that. <laughs> the Benham Brothers, you know, they, they were supposed to have a show on HGTV. I'm sure you've seen the news. 
Um, the other day it was announced that SunTrust had, uh, Bank had severed ties with them on many properties that they were selling. Uh, they've since reversed that decision. You should know that when we were in California, this story was hot. Pasadena City College. That's Pasadena City College. It's pretty nice looking, let me tell you. Um, they were going to have uh, a commencement speaker, a gay activist, but somebody published a pretty bad video of the gay activist and his boyfriend online. So Pasadena City College, the Board of Trustees withdrew the invitation for him to speak at commencement. He's a big guy in Hollywood. Um, can't remember his name right now. But um, so they said, OK, but we'll bring in Eric Walsh. He's the director of public health for the city of Pasadena. He went to this college. Everybody likes him. He's a good guy. So the gay mafia got online, found out he's a Seventh-day Adventist, menaced part-time minister. He had preached against homosexuality. He had preached against abortion. He said evolution was satanic. And so the city of Pasadena suspended him from his job. He didn't get the invitation, that was gone, to speak at commencement. He, he lost his job. They had a discussion at the LA Times. Listen to what one person said in the blog. But that misses what seems to be the more salient point in Walsh's case. Not only did he pop off about the various kinds of people he believes are condemned by God, he also specifically rejected evolution, which he regards as the mischievous work of Satan rather than a fact of science. Those remarks suggest not just intolerance or religious fervor, but active rejection of science important to carrying out his work as a health officer. In that instance, his comments raise questions not so much about his beliefs as about his competence. Would Pasadena want a health director who claimed tobacco did not cause heart disease or who insisted that climate change was a myth? And so the result of it was he's now resigned. He had a job offer to go work for the state of Georgia, and that job offer has now been withdrawn. As it was in the days of Noah and Lot, it'll be like that in the end times. And we as a body need to be prepared to help people out that are going to lose their jobs. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to make some noise here because I'm not putting this one out there. This is for your consumption only. You need to pray for me. I was at our firm retreat three weeks ago. We had a diversity consultant come in and speak to us. She said, corporations want to hire firms that have a commitment to diversity and the sole, the sole thing that they look at is how many out in the open LGBT lawyers you have in your law firm. And if you don't, you're not diverse, you don't have a commitment to diversity, and the numbers they're talking about are 12 or 13% of your lawyers need to be at least out in the open. And if you're not diverse, corporations won't hire you. I've been saying this for a long time. They're coming for us, folks, okay? You need to think about it. You need to be prepared. You need to be in the word, faithful, committed, in prayer, in a fellowship, because I think we're all going to need each other. That's just my thinking. I don't know when our exit date is, okay? It's happening all over the place. These are just public examples of what I am sure is happening at a private level very much. So that's the prophecy update for this week. I know, very upbeat, uplifting, but you need to be aware of these things. Let's pray. Father, protect us. Give us your spirit. Keep us in your word, faithful, committed separated unto you until Jesus returns. In Jesus' name, amen.